Hello, welcome back to a Better Brain Summit. I'm your host, Dr. Patrick Porter. Today, I have a very special guest, someone I can call a friend. We've been working together for a number of years. We, we started out looking at uh, heart rate variability as one of the things that we kind of got together on at first. And we met at a conference, and then he came back with his own tools and techniques. He's a researcher. He never takes no for an answer, and he goes out and researches and finds out what works. He's also the author of a book that I think everyone on this summit needs to read. It's called Saving Your Brain. And that's what he's going to be talking a little bit about today. Who I'm talking about is Dr. Kelly Miller. So uh, Dr. Miller, welcome to the summit. I'm going to let you take it away. You have a little presentation for us. So let us let us go through that first. Good morning. I got my coat on here. See, it's it's, it's like 60 degrees in Tampa today. It's really cold. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Okay, yeah. let's get rolling here. So this information is uh, a lot of this information we're going to share is in this book, Saving Your Brain Causes Prevention, Reversal of Dementia, Alzheimer's. I started that in 2015 and I uh, published it in 2018 and and this is a global approach to uh, just general brain health and it has um, lots of information has the brain tap and as we've uh, delved into this more and more um, we've uh, learned that we need to also take a hemispheric approach many times to people you know, strengthening the, either the left or right hemisphere so we're going to talk about that a little bit as well but you know today um, we are absolutely in a brain dysfunction epidemic and uh, we're going to talk a, a, a lot about the aging brain but we've got uh, ADHD uh, over one in ten of the population you know boys more than girls but it's the number one reason for uh, children to be medicated and there's been over a two thousand percent increase in the use of medication and the medication hasn't changed for 50 years so it's they're really on an outdated model that this is a chemical imbalance and we know that it's not a, it, there's much more than that there's a actually problems with the uh, different systems in the brain autism spectrum last stats i saw were one in 38 you know 20 years ago we we're talking about one in 10,000. 50 million americans are medicated for anxiousness since covid in insomnia we have 60 million americans have sleeping disorder so these are these are all indications of brain dysfunction and alzheimer's now the fifth leading cause of death and you know one in ten over the age of 70 are going to have this so really big problems when we're talking about the aging brain uh, a person has probably had Alzheimer's for about 15 years before their diagnosis and there's seven stages of Alzheimer's and most people don't get diagnosed till stage three or four. We're just going to go over that. Obviously stage one, there's no memory problems, but there's already some neurodegenerative changes beginning. Uh, stage two, forgetting familiar words, location of eyeglasses or everyday objects. You know, that's when you're always misplacing your phone, misplacing things. Uh, I think a lot of us are, are, are there. Stage three, mild cognitive impairment uh, this is usually when your friends and family co-workers start noticing some little differences uh, problems with words and names misusing those and uh, decreased ability to remember names after introductions and this will start uh, you know this individual will start to have performance issues in social settings in the workplace uh, with friends and family and co-workers and there's a marked decrease in retaining information after reading it Again, losing or misplacing valuable objects. So uh, that could be more uh, besides your phone and your eyeglasses. And then there's a uh, decrease in the ability to plan and organize. A lot of patients here with stage four when uh, they get an official diagnosis and have difficulty with simple arithmetic and have poor short-term short memory. So they can't remember what they had for breakfast or lunch or what they ate yesterday. And again, they're having more and more problems and ability to manage their finance or pay bills and may start to forget details of their life histories. In stage five, this is where as healthcare providers, we should absolutely recognize by this stage. And that's when you're just interviewing someone. So it's it's important, I think, when you know with different people and we're dealing with them that we need to talk about them, have the pe person talk about themselves and do some recollection. Oh, where'd you go to high? Where'd you go to high school? You know, where you came to college, and and uh, it's scary sometimes uh, what they can't recall. Again, they can be confused about the date and the day of the week or the season. You know, dressing inappropriately uh, for the season or the occasion. And then you know, we just do different things. Like lots of times, we'll have the patient subtract two from a hundred, or you know, uh, by fours. And again, uh, they usually retain most of the information about themselves and know their own name and the names of their spouse and children here and they usually don't have any problem 
as far as uh, bathing themselves or, or getting meals and things like this. At stage six, this is definitely someone who's going to have to have a caretaker and they're going to have to help feed them, go to the bathroom and different things like this. They're going to start losing a lot of speech and uh, very little speech or uh, just in fragments and um, dealt with patients in this. Uh, we actually had one patient that was in this stage who had been nonverbal for several months and, and uh, started speaking again and was not able to control their bladder and was able to go to the bathroom on their own own and things like that. So um, you don't want to wait till get someone's that bad, but you, you can turn it around, but they're going to need an awful lot of support from family. So at stage seven, uh, basically this person is very vegetative. They have their posture is really bad. They're going to be stooped over. They have, they've lost movement. They're going to have trouble swallowing. And this is something, you know, in the aging patient, we need to think about when people are starting to have problems with swallowing, that they're probably in cognitive decline. And, and one of the things also, um, I want to point out with people when we look at postural things, you know, coming from a chiropractic background, you know, we always were looking at posture, people's forward head posture, leaning at the waist and things like that. And, um, you know, always thought those were biomechanical, but we know now that that's actually a sign of the frontal cortex weakening. And one of the things, um, it's an ipsilateral system to the frontal cortex called the PM, uh, pons meticular reticulating uh, formation, but basically it activates your extensor muscles. If the frontal cortex isn't active, you can't get these extensor muscles and so you're in, you're going into flex. So that's something that we should be more aware of, that that's a sign and also uh, a lack of arm swinging is a problem. So, you know, one of the issues with Alzheimer's, with all the resources out there, all the pharmacological billions and billions, hundreds of billions of uh, dollars in research, you know, there's been 350 studies and they haven't come up with anything really. Uh, the best case scenario, you may get some may, some minor improvement for a few uh, weeks, months. And the reason is because drugs only work on a single pathway. And when we look at Alzheimer's, there are multiple causes that can create this beta amyloid form formation and the plaquing. And we're going to co uh, cover that. So in my book, Saving Your Brain, each letter is an acronym. We're going to kind of briefly go over that. And, um, you know, about two months before I published my book, Dale Bretson published his book, The End of Alzheimer. And for you guys, that's another great book you need to read. And, uh, he was a medical researcher, pharmacological researcher, and he came to the conclusion, not, we're not going to find a drug for this. And uh, in his book, he has the big three, which I'll cover from mine uh, as well. But sleep is uh, a big thing. So when we have disruptive sleep, a change in our sleep pattern, this absolutely is an indication of a brain problem. Okay. So I want you to think of that when people are having sleep problems, they're having brain problems. And as the brain problem corrects, the sleep will correct as well. But when we do, when, and, uh, Dr. Porter was talking about heart rate variability earlier. When we when we test people of heart rate variability, we see 80, 90 percent of the people are not getting delta sleep. You know, they they have they're having lots of delta wave activity in their brains during conscious times, which is not good. And there's actually five different uh, separate sleep cycles, and we go over those about five times in a night, and we we should accumulate about 90 minutes in each. And when we don't get into this delta sleep, our brain can't metabolically clean itself. So it's like our brain actually almost shrinks 50% in these delta stage, and it's it's like a, a ringing out the wash. Uh, rag or, you know, getting rid of all the, the bad stuff in the brain. So we've got to get into that deep sleep. A is autonomic balance. Again, this is something I think unique. Uh, I don't think, you know, in the medical realm, when we look at different th things and Mark Hyman and different things, not picking on anybody, but when we're talking in global approaches there is that um, uh, in chiropractic, we should recognize uh, certainly the autonomic imbalance and that this is a, in today's world that most people are living in the sympathetic and they're not getting in the parasympathetic. And we're going to talk about some other things that will cause that. But basically when we are in the sympathetic, we're going to produce cortisol. Cortisol is a response to inflammation and acute stress, but short-term is good, but long-term it, it basically kills our neurons, particularly the hippocampus, which takes short-term and long-term. So V is for vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of studies about micronutrients related to the development of Alzheimer's and uh, two chapters in the book on, uh, on that 
Uh, B12 is very big for the brain, but there's many other nutrients. Cooperzine A or club moss is really very good at uh, preventing beta f- formation. But when we look at um, the beta production, we're going to look at uh, basically an abnormal physiology that is created making uh, a beta. So our body produces a beta all the time based on certain circumstances. Circumstances, And one of those is chronic infections. And uh, and being in Florida, one of the things uh, I recently, I guess maybe it was over two or three years ago, I found that I had a chronic mold infection and I probably had it, you know, for several years. I remember going back now that we had a, uh, when I was still living in Missouri, that we had a water leak and uh, in their house and uh, one in four people are very susceptible to mold infections. So this is something I really want to pound the table to you people listening today, everyone listening. We need to check for mold infections when people have that chronic inflammation brain fog, cognitive decline. And uh, there is a great website called uh, uh, www.survivingmold.com. And under the diagnosis section, there's a visual acuity test that you can take for uh, $15. It's a great screening for uh, mold infection. And then again, they can follow up with uh, mycotoxins test. But one of the things that a beta does is it functions like an antibiotic. So doesn't it make sense? It's better to take us 15 to 20 years to die of all Alzheimer's than to die of an infection of the brain. We get that concept. So that's an adaptation that's necessary based on this chronic infection. And we see this a lot with Lyme people. So if you anybody out there dealing with Lyme, they have a lot of inflammation, infection in their brain. So this is just uh, some study from on the chronic acute neurotoxicity, uh, excitotoxicity, and, and the the amount of infections related to that. So all the MS patients I have seen in here in Florida have had a uh, mold infection. So uh, the interesting thing, we're going to talk about the right and left brain, but people, you know, there's like 50 million people or something like that, that have autoimmune tendencies in the United States. And what we see uh, is that those are more right brain weakness people generally. And uh, we're going to show you some more information on that. But again, I'm dealing with ADHD and autistic children. So most of these autistic children we find are also have got mold infections as well. So please start checking that out. It can really make an impact. This is just a researcher uh, paper from Dale Bretson on mycotoxins. And what he was saying is that simply breathing these mycotoxins can create an environment that you'd produce the abeta plaquing and create Alzheimer's. And again, I want to emphasize that one in four people in the population are very susceptible to this. So you're going to see it in families, right? Because they have uh, inheritable traits. So N is for neurohormones. So when we see, when we look at somebody with Alzheimer's or significant cog- cognitive decline, Parkinson's, other things, their hormone levels are much lower than their peers who were uh, healthier. We see low thyroid function doubles the risk of uh, Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. So one of the things we test is we use a device called the Thyroflex, which measures intracellular T3 levels. Again, it's a non-invasive test, it's FDA cleared. But the uh, hormones are again react to stress. So the a, a chronically stressed brain, you're going to have a drop in hormone levels. Genetic variants, so 50% of the late onset of Alzheimer's patients have this ApoE4 gene. ApoE4 gene is actually an LDL. Many of you may not know, but we have five HDLs and seven LDLs uh, in, in the, uh, that affect this. So this purpose of ApoE4 is it takes a beta out of the brain. And this particular gene variant is just least of, uh, less effective of that, but it can be made more effective by supplementing with niacin exercise and keeping our ins, uh, blood sugars regulated. So when we look at Alzheimer's, the early onsets are diagnosed before the age of 65 and the late onset after the age of 65. So only 5% of the population is diagnosed before the age of 65. And there are three different genetic traits. I'm not going to go over those with you, but when we actually look at those younger individuals, only one in five of them have those genes. So what is that telling us? That tells us that there are other environmental factors that are damaging the brain, right? So that's, again, lifestyle and environment trumps genes. They can turn off genes. So why is your lifestyle belief and thoughts? Again, because whatever our belief system is going to dictate our behavior and our patterns uh, and uh, habits. And But just the fact that 
you know, when we ask, one of the things I always ask our patients is on a scale of zero to 10, how stressed do you feel? You know, and if they're like an eight, nine, 10, they are, and versus a one, two, or three, they're 400% more likely to have early cognitive decline in Alzheimer's. So that's how bad stress is for our brain. O is for obesity and oxidative stress. So again, we're generally getting bigger. You know, we all look, we all look a little bigger than we did in 1980, right? This is something we need to kind of look at, but basically as you know, the more body fat we accumulate, the smaller our brain is. And all these brain problems are aggravated by increased weight and oxidative stress. U is for in friendly environment. Again, we've got a lot of things, mercury and aluminum are neurotoxic. They accumulate in the brain. And what we see is in Alzheimer's patients is these beta placking are surrounding these heavy metals and these heavy metals and fluoride and thing are in the brain. And again, one of the other functions of a beta is it's something called a ligand, but what it, that means is it binds with heavy metals. So another function of the beta is involved in binding with heavy metals. And then we still have like 95% of us have DDT, even though it's been outlawed since the 70s. And that is a bad combination. And every patient, almost every patient, I, I test pretty high level glyphosate. So glyphosate is a byproduct of GMO foods and the Roundup, because the more as, uh, Roundup has increased like 400% usage over the last 20 years because they have these super weeds that are come up around the GMO crop. So again, we have EMFs. So great book, uh, Radiation Nation talks about uh, the hazards of electromagnetic frequencies and, you know, 5G. This is actually increasing our permeability of our blood brain barrier and increasing the risk fourfold. Other things, high fructose corn syrup, we, one of the things we don't know about, that's actually a neurotoxin. And MSG, aspartame, these are actually called neuro uh, excitotoxins. They'll actually cause glutamate to be overactivated and it'll just, it'll make your cells go, go, go and, until they die. Repetitive head trauma is a poster boy for this, playing rugby for 21 years. And uh, one of the things I want to make you aware of someone who's had a big trauma or repetitive trauma are 40, 50% of these people will develop um, hypothalamus and pituitary problems. And they'll have signaling problems, getting information and sending information to the adrenals and the thyroid and the gonads. So many of these people will need some permanent help you know, with uh, thyroid uh, and adrenal gonad function, bioidentical hormones many times. So these are from Dr. Amon's slides. Um, I was fortunate to hear him lecture a couple of times at the A4M. And uh, I would say as far as in the medical world, he probably mimics or our, you know, approaches are, are, are much more like his, he uses a lot of the same tools. He uses audiovisual trainers. He uses uh, neurofeedback. So he, he, he's a little more active than most of the other practitioners out there who are talking about brain. So blood flow is critical. You know, our brain uses 15% of our total cardiac output, 20% of the oxygen, 25% of the glucose. So when we rehabilitate patients, and uh, we always make sure they have water there and they have food because when we, when you have a weakened brain and you start strengthening the brain, you know, you're going to run out of fuel pretty quick. So this is something that's really important. Again, this is a, just a picture of the SPECT imaging showing the massive lack of circulation because really what the SPECT uh, is showing you a 3D evaluation of circulation in the brain. And Dr. Amen has done so many of these, he's, he can see patterns that probably 99% of other people that look in SPECT imaging uh, can't see. So reading is very important and reading from a paper copy actually works a little better than the working off a screen. But uh, lots of research to show improves memory, lengthens life, makes us smarter, uh, can actually reduce uh, blood pressure, improve our sleep pattern, make us more empathetic. A is for activity. Again, lots of studies out there showing that exercise reduces Alzheimer's risk. Uh, this is something really big in the Parkinson's
patients, you know, they've done specific types of exercise and showed a reduction in the motor activity. And one of the things I want to um, talk to people a lot about Parkinson's is that that is actually a form of dementia. And, and it's, uh, it's a problem in the substantia nigra, a lack of dopamine, but there's also interconnected problems with the basal ganglion and the frontal cortex that's involved in that. So again, ex if we exercise, we have better insulin sensitivity and again, helps uh, growth hormone. Again, just having more insulin sensitivity decreases a beta formation and vice versa when we're, our blood sugars are creeping up. So I like all my patients, their fasting levels to be under 95. And, uh, but just the fact that we get these spiking in our blood will create more beta formation as well. So that's the third trifecta in Dr. Bredson's work. And we talked about uh, environmental toxicities chronic infections, and blood sugar dysregulation. So N is for neurotransmitters. So it, generally speaking, in the aging brain and the Alzheimer's brain will have a lack of dopamine and acetylcholine. Uh, dopamine is more associated, associated with beta wave patterns, which we'll look at a little bit later in acetylcholine, more alpha. Uh, interesting, again, when we talk about Parkinson's, uh, if we give the Parkinson patient things that will stimulate their dopamine, that will reduce their motor dysfunction. Uh, but if we give a acetylcholine, that will actually make it worse. So again, if you're, you're uh, treating these people, be sure you uh, try to help the dopamine, but you want to inhibit the acetylcholine. So we look at the brain, uh, many different parts, but you can see the blue part, which is almost half of the total brain is our frontal cortex. That's our executive decision-making. And we talked about earlier, that's very sensitive to estrogen and, and testosterone and women and men. And uh, it's, it creates our movement. So again, when we have dopamine deficiency, we see in the Parkinson patients, we see that lack of rigidity, but you see that rigidity in the Alzheimer's patient as well. It's just not as uh, pronounced. So one of the things I want to talk about is the hemispheric difference here. This is something that uh, became more aware of. And uh, I recently just finished a fellowship with Robert Melillo and um, which I don't know, 20, over 20 years ago, he was talking about this and he was really talking about right hemispheric weakness because uh, he had a son who is in the spectrum and he had a passion in that area. And everything he's really said uh, has come to fruition and is really being proved in research now. There's just tens of studies, again, showing uh, this hemispheric difference, even though the brain, it can look very similar. Uh, our left brain is more analytical thought, logic, language, science, and math. The right is more holistic thought, intuition, creativity, art, and music. And generally what we're seeing is that we're seeing more left brain dominant people in right brain weakness, just generally in the world. Um, you know, younger, when I deal with the older population, most of these are left hemispheric weakness. But when we talk about, when I say a younger generation, people 40 and under, 30 and under, 20 under, you see a more predominance of the right uh, brain weakness. Not that I don't see the left brain in younger people as well, but I just want to kind of go over some of the differences here. So when, you, when you're talking to someone and thinking about it, uh, so left brain people are very small picture, detail oriented. See, I'm very left brain. I'm, I, can, I can get hung up on details like doing office procedures and things versus, you know, seeing the big picture. So verbal, left brain, nonverbal, right brain, small muscles, left brain, big muscles, right brain. So that's why you see the autistic individuals are usually kind of clumsy and they don't have good motor skills, usually not athletic. The left brain IQ, the right brain EQ. So again, you see the difference 
when we look at like an autism person, you could have five kids in a room, they'd all have their backs turned to each other and they'd be looking at some little thing in minute detail, okay? Because they're not, they're not looking around. So again, we just go through all these different things. Um, positive emotions are registered in the left brain, negative emotions on the right brain. Some of the other things that we're, you know, right now we're talking about mold infection and we're talking about COVID. And I want you uh, to be, understand that people are gonna react to the vaccines totally different, whether they're left or right brain. And the left brain activates immunity. So what you see in an older population, if their left brain is weakening, what do you mean? They have a weakened immune system, right? When we see the right brain suppresses immunity. So what is autoimmunity? It's a lack of suppression. That means their, their immune response is hypervigilant, overreactive, right? So these people, my opinion, are going to be really at risk. Anyone with um, autoimmune things getting this type vaccine that's going to be affecting the genetic material. I, I, I really have some problems, uh, fearful for these people. But again, we just see different things are uh, like our left nostril, which goes to our left brain. Everything else crosses over, smells good things more. The right brain, the right nostril is more unpleasant things. So there's definitely a different things. Uh, your right brain is your gut feeling. So if you don't have, if people don't have, are not in touch with their bodies, they don't have gut feelings, then they're probably weak on the right side. But here we even see different nutrients, different things when we look at uh, the left brain, we see like acetylcholine and dopamine are more, or generally called to support that. On the other side, with someone with the right brain weakness usually is gonna need GABA serotonin. And that's not 100%, that's just generally, when we see people that are having a lot of depression, that's usually a left brain weakness. When we see the manic, that's usually a right brain weakness. Cut, go over now a little bit about our assessments uh, from our, we do a combination of low tech, high tech. We do a very thorough examination and just the physical examination is probably 30 minutes where we're, we're checking many neurological things. But we also use the max pulse because we want to know how their circulation is doing. We do the heart rate variability because we want to know what their nervous system is doing. We do the Thyroflex, which is going to give us uh, thyroid readings. We use a device called the right eye, which is an infrared camera that measures eye movement. And our eye movements are controlled by the brain stem, the cerebellum, and the parietal and the frontal cortex. So just by uh, having people look at things left and right, up and down, we can tell how their brain is functioning. We use a, something called the balance tracks. And in that we can quantitatively evaluate their their balance compared to their peers uh, and their age group. And the other thing we can do is we can assess the canals in the ear. So we got three canals in the ear. Uh, one measures acceleration in this plane, one is up and down and the other is what they call yaw, side to side. So that's part of our vestibular system, keeps us upright. And again, this is something that we can check with this and then we can uh, quantitate it and treat it. We use an interactive metronome, which is a cowbell in the ears, but it it's check, uh, evaluates the synchrony between the cerebellum, parietal, and frontal cortex. And then we also use brain mapping, which we do um, questionnaires on neural behavior and also cognitive function. So again, we use the Melillo method as far as an evaluation. We're looking at tone symmetry. We're looking at primitive reflexes. We're looking at core strength. We're looking at growth strength. And then we're, again, we're looking at the uh, vestibular system, the balance, the canals, oculomotor, optokinetic, visual system. I want to talk a little bit about primitive reflexes. You know, I think I, I, I knew about primitive reflexes. I think I was at a brain tap conference and there was a, Dr. Nancy was talking about brain uh, primitive reflexes maybe three or four years ago. And I can be honest, I just, I was very confused from that. Um, so this is something that you can do in like three or four minutes. 
And I would just really encourage all the practitioners, this is something that you need to start checking. Because the significance of these primitive reflexes is they're necessary for survival and they live in the brainstem, in other words, where they come from. And they should go away by six months, eight months, different ones, you know, different times, but certainly by a year, they should be gone. And this is, when they are gone, that means they're integrated into the brainstem. And the, this is the beginning of the polyvagal or the parasympathetic nervous system. So when people don't have, when they still have primitive reflexes, their parasympathetic system is not functioning correctly, right? So you're going to have an oversympathetic because when we're born, we only have a sympathetic nervous system. When these primitive reflexes are integrated, that's when we start developing the parasympathetic. And these will create certain neuro neurobehaviors and doing functional medicine for years, I would have people with like leaky gut or different situ situations and we just couldn't resolve them. And now that same patient, the reason is, is because they had primitive reflexes and, and that system was undeveloped. So this is something you can go on YouTube. I've got on my YouTube station, I've got an examination, but this is something that really, really important to start checking out on patients. So again, we're looking at core strength. We do, uh, we look at their pelvic lift. Can they do a side plank? Can they do uh, like a Superman? We also have them do like sit-ups and push-ups. And there's, there's quantitative data for that. And I can just tell you, if you have a chronic brain problem and you do not fix these primitive reflexes and you do not address their core strength, you will never fix the problem. I've, I've done this enough that I, I'm just telling you, you've got, to, you've got to do those two things. So again, we're looking at the uh, balance. So we're doing, a. this is basically looking a lot of if, uh, function of the cerebellum and we get a lot of quantitative data off the balance tracks as well. But the rub we're trying to do with that is we're trying to, in this physical examination, we're trying to determine the weaker cerebellar side, which is going to be opposite the weaker frontal cortex. Okay. So if you have a, in the older people, they have a left frontal cortex. Most of them are going to have a right cerebellum weakness. And we're going to put in, input to the right side to the cerebellum and crosses over to the frontal cortex. So left hemispheric weakness, right sensory input, right hemispheric weakness, left sensory input. Of course, we can do all this. Um, you know, we can look at their eyes and you'll see different things, but it's really hard to pick up a lot of these things. And that's why, like the right eye, we also, I'm going to show you another little device that's pretty inexpensive that you can uh, video the eye movements and pick up much more. So I want to talk a little bit about the vestibular system here, because this is part of what we're looking at with the canals and the balance. And chronic pain patients. So I know there's some of our, many of our listeners are chiropractors, chronic neck pain, chronic back pain. And what I can tell you is that and from the research and what we find is that they have a vestibular problem and that's affecting these intrinsic muscles because the vestibular spinal tract is really what, what maintains the tone and balance and strength of these small muscle groups. And lots of times we'll see like in someone who's in a car crash, whiplash type injury, they have a sprain strain, but the really the chronic issue is they have a vestibular problem because their eyes are off and they're looking at computer screens and things. And this is causing a, a chronic, spasm and balance in their neck muscles. So again, this is a, uh, another study, and I just wanna point this out. I said before that depression is usually a left hemispheric weakness. And here's a research showing that people who had, 80% of these patients who had chronic depression had a hypoactivity in the right vestibular pathways in their brainstem. Okay. So again, that is 
that's going to come up over here and cross over. So again, this is just showing an involvement in the vestibular system, why we want to look at that and why we want to get that better for patients. So this is one of our younger patients who, uh, his grandfather I was treating for some cognitive decline he brought in, he was having uh, school problems. And so this is this little camera, we can watch his eye movement here. Oops. Okay. So again, the eye should be symmetrically. We can always see his right eye is kind of inward a little bit there. And he's going to go through some eye movement here and a bit. Not quite sure why we're not seeing that. There we go. Okay. So basically, we're just having the person go look, have the patient go left, right, left, right with their eyes, and then up and down, up and down with their eyes. And we'll see some asymmetry here. So what I want you to get from this is this abnormal eye movement is not a muscle problem. It's not a cranial nerve problem. It's a whole brain problem. It's a problem in their cerebellum. It's a problem in their frontal cortex. So when we look at that, say we saw a deviation right there. Okay. But that's a, that's a, actually, I think that device is like seven or $50. So not a super expensive thing, but it's, it's a great visual. Anytime we can show a patient, you know, visual. So here's our right eye. One of our older patients, this is a um, gentleman is a 88 year old CEO, multi-million dollar company comes in just to stay because he still wants to be running the, running the show at the office. So this is a kind of report from the right eye and it's measuring, it's giving an overall score from zero to hundred eye score. So 38 is not very good. Pursuits, that means that's like watching a train go by. You know, you're just watching a continual motion movement of things. Saccade, that's like you're you're in traffic and you're looking to the left, looking to the right, looking to the left. That's a saccade moving from place to place. And then fixation is the ability just to focus on one area. So on this individual had this test, the pursuits are very poor and th that is controlled from this part of the brain. So again, we get an idea. And more importantly, then we can see, uh, you can see in the picture of the brain here, their areas are red. When we implement interventions, then this is another objective tool we can use to show that there's improvement in the brain function. So we'll have many people, I've had some people go from 38 to 80 over, uh, over a couple months period. So this is just, I'm gonna show you a little bit live action. The cool thing about this test is you can actually replay this for a patient. So you can actually show eye movement. So this is what this individual's left and right eye are doing, watching a something just go round and round in a perfect circle. So they're not they're not working very well, are they? So again, we see a difference. So horizontal tracking measures serotonin levels. So if someone has a problem like this, they probably have some serotonin problems. And again, serotonin is inhibitory. It's a calmer down of the brain. Okay, here's our heart rate variability and using the max pulse, same time. Again, for, if, for any of you out there who's not, who are dealing with people, uh, this is just one of the tools you've got to get from Patrick. Um, you know, he makes these available at a very reasonable price. It's got great graphics. It tells you like 12 different things that are going on in, in the brain, but this is just a piece of a pie and, and the green is the parasympathetic, the rest digest, the yellow is the sympathetic fight flight, and the red is the neurohormonal response. So normally these should be fairly, uh, you know, like a third, third, and third. And again, based on different activities, you know, we can get stressed, you could, one is gonna 
go up and go down. But what we see a lot is this picture on the right. See that little tiny sliver in the green? That's the people's parasympathetic system. So they got no potential for healing, repair in men. They're going to have dichronic digestive problems. They're going to have immune problems. They're going to have sleeping problems. So this is just a, a, a max pulse. It shows four different functional cardiovascular assessments. The DPI on the lower right, we're looking at, I'll use my cursor here. Let's just think of overall heart function. So this is um, in the 22 percentile. So if 50% of, of us are going to die of cardiovascular complications, we don't want to be in the, in the, the bottom quartile. Eccentric contraction, the left atrium. So that's just pushing the blood out. Again, very poor. Arterial elasticity. And this is when this actually was done uh, by my spouse, Dr. Hoff, when I first got your brain tap. I don't know, this is when I came in, I brought this device. Uh, I don't know how many years ago that was, three or four years ago. But she was going through a bad time. Her mom was in a uh, nursing home and uh, assisted living and was failing. And her favorite 14 year old poodle, her fourth poodle was on the way out and she, and was, she was up all night and uh, she wasn't sleeping well. So AE is arterial elasticity, 38% and then RBV is remaining blood volume. Look at her stress score look at this is her blood vessel the intima and in her blood vessel so this family history of cardiovascular problem this is not a good readings here this is the same readings on the left that i just showed you a, a smaller I, I went in there and this is 20 minutes later see the time stamp what is that 17 and plus 11 28 minutes later she did one brain tap session and we got 100% improvement in overall heart function, a 300% efficiency in the, the contraction of her left atrium, 100% plus improvement in her arterial elasticity. Now this is big. Arterial elasticity is a major predictor for future cardiovascular events. So if you can change Arterial elasticity, this is where all the stuff about nitric oxide, you know, produce production and trying to get the intima to producing more. So this is huge. And this is, this is done. All we did was calm her brain down with, I think she did a stress reduction or something like enchanted for us, one of those. So what it is calmed her brain down. So her brain controls the physiology. So there's no doubt that people have strokes and heart attacks every day because they've got they can't de-stress their brain so this is just the thyroflex we has this little hammer that we check the brachioradialis reflex it measures the speed ideally it's 50 to 100 milliseconds if it's over the 100 milliseconds you've got not enough t3 in the cells so again this individual's had 187 milliseconds again a hypothyroid patient so here we have brain mapping. This is one of the uh, major tools. We have uh, nine, 18, uh, excuse me, 19 points of reference here. And uh, we'll show you what that looks like. So this is delta waves. So we talked about delta waves not being good in the uh, heart rate variability. We see a spike a lots of times in people in their delta waves. And this is a confirmation. So again, delta waves are slow brain wave. That's when we're in our deepest sleep. So if we have an abundance of these delta waves, that, that, that means like we're trying to drive the car and we got the parking brake on. And that's really how what's happening with our brain. And this is secondary to... Uh, Traumatic brain injuries, you're going to get a lot of this. You'll also get it with food, chemical, allergy sensitivities, heavy metals, pesticides, herbicides, plastics. And again, I want to emphasize chronic infections in the brain. So again, this is something we'll see in um, the ADHD kid many times. 
a lot of high delta, but also in the aging brain. Another thing that the brain mapping shows is uh, asymmetry, imbalance. So generally speaking, our left frontal cortex, our left half should be a little more beta, a little stronger in beta, and our right half should be a little stronger in alpha. So when we have the opposite, like in this individual, instead of being the beta on the left, it's on the right, then we that creates anxiety. And the anxiety, if it goes long enough, it will, it will turn into uh, depression. So this we see this abnormality in beta and alpha all the time. So here we're going to talk about treatments now. What do we do? We've done all these assessments. Now, how do we fix the brain? So one of the things we do is we primary, we're going to get rid of the primitive reflexes. There's different exercises for that. We use the shed light laser on different uh, parts of the brain. The, uh, why it, I, we like that is because it will do infrared and red light and it will do different frequencies. So we can use a red light at 10 Hertz and the brain stem and the cerebellum and we can do infrared and 40 Hertz for the frontal cortex different frequencies, different types of light, they respond better. This is one 85 year old guy. I've got a video up of him doing his core strength on my uh, YouTube station. So he's an inspiration, 85 year olds. He's in his exercise class with 60 year olds. He kicks their ass. So he's Superman. Here's another one of our 80 year old places, uh, patients doing uh, just some rehab on the balance. And again, if you can see on the screen, he's actually doing uh, angular things. So he's going left to right and, and, and like a big cross here. So we can do left, right, front, back. We can do moving circles, moving targets. And again, this is helping this person integrate, getting their brain and their feet coordinated. And of course, our tool is one of the things we do is every patient goes home with a brain tap. So this is part of every patient's brain rehab program. And what we do from the brain mapping uh, is we use different frequencies. So many times the patient will have a global uh, problem with, uh, let's say they got too much delta. So we want to do alpha to speed up their brain. Or they may have a deficiency in beta. So we want to do SMR to strengthen that. So most of our patients have one or two global uh, apps that we want to really pound with the brain tap. And they also, many of them will have a left and right. So in the, in the brain tap under new mind training, we have for the beta imbalance, we have a left 15 to 20 Hertz and a right 12 to 15 to get the beta more on the left. And then we also have a app where we do uh, 15 to 20 hertz beta on the left and we're doing 9 to 11 of alpha on the right. We're going to work on some more programs, but sometimes the alpha is too high. We might just want to bring it down a bit or we want to speed it up. So we can do all that with the apps on the brain tap. So I love that tool and um, we're very happy with what we're able to accomplish with patients with that. Uh, this is just showing uh, one of the graphics on the on the uh, heart rate variability that we use. This is an Alzheimer patient, and this is again the timestamp is like 40 minutes. So this was after a rehab session. So this is when she came in, and uh, it was like 10 10 percent, and when she finished, it was 81. It was like an 800 percent improvement in her brainwave activity. So another tool that we use is neurofeedback. And again, what we do from the brain mapping is uh, after we get the information is we will put that into the brain tap and home therapy, and then we'll target specific areas in the brain. So if you look at this picture over here, we might be doing the frontal cortex. Okay, we might use, uh, these are lateral, These all these are in the frontal cortex where we might use a temporal or a parietal or an occipital 
again, based off the information and what part of the brain is the most imbalanced and we're trying to, to do that. So this has visual feedback. So when the brain is functioning um, not as well, the picture is gonna get darker. When the, when the brain is functioning better, the picture is gonna get brighter. And it also has an auditory feedback, which is particularly good for autistic children. And again, the sound is going up and down based on the brain and the brain is built for survival. So it will self-correct. It will try to see better and try to hear better by performing those better brainwave frequencies. This interactive metronome, again, this helps reset the timing and synchrony between the cerebellum uh, parietal and the frontal cortex. This is one of our stroke patients who was uh, paralyzed on her right side for three years where we actually we started doing hemispheric sensory input and we were able to get her arm and leg moving again, which she hadn't done for three years, just in a few sessions. So this is a interactive 55 inch touchscreen to a hundred different job functions on it. So again, we do a lot of that off the cognitive testing and the different testing we'll use, we'll do specific exercises to strengthen that weakened area of the brain. So it's really about finding the weak areas and that's the real key to the, the brain is trying to find the weak areas and try to be as specific as, as possible. This is another uh, called NeuroSage. This was developed by Kyle Daigle and uh, Robert Melillo and uh, Brandon Crawford have also had a lot of input to this. Uh, Brandon Crawford has a shed light laser. So this young individual is actually getting treatment to the right cerebellum. There's actually another laser over here treating his left frontal cortex, but he is um, doing one of the games. So that they also have 3D capability with this technology. So again, this is another interaction of getting sensory input through the ears. We put patients on the vibration plate with this as well. And uh, so here we're gonna talk about just some results very quickly. So this is a uh, patient 60 days. Uh, this is like an 80 year old patient cognitive decline. So 36% of the brain change almost 50% towards normalization improvement. This is the same person I gave their screen before and after. So we can see normalization of this excess delta. Okay, again, delta is slow brain wave activity, hot tire brain, most of that is normalized in 60 day, phenomenal changes. And again, this was done primarily with brain tap, exercise, and nutrition. So this was before I was doing, that dates back before I was doing the hemispheric, which I would have even got better results. So this is remembering uh, numbers backwards. So really at that age, if they can do four better, four is good, you know. And even though that, so five is pretty darn good. This is another device, this is a frontal cortex exercise. Again, attention, they went from average to above average. This is remembering eight numbers verbally. I don't think I can remember eight numbers. That's a phone number plus, okay? So that's excellent. This is filtering. So this is a problem between the basal ganglion and the prefrontal cortex, but basically it's called the Stroop test. So this is a great screener. You, you know, guys, you can download the Stroop test or a Stroop effect 20 or 60 second app and you can have a patient do that very quickly. In this one, it is you're seeing words and the words may say red, green or purple or whatever, but the text in the words, so let's say it's green, but it's, it's the text is red. So the instructions are you're going to hit the color that matches the color of the text or the color of the ink. And even if you go over this with people three times, four times, you know, they do practice, because that part of the brain is not working well, they'll, they'll, they'll say whatever the word says. Overall executive function, he went from average to above to uh, average. So again, very nice changes. 
so that's kind of our approach and uh, whether it's uh, it's a left brain problem or it's a right brain problem you know you, you it's the only difference is where you're putting most of the sensory input in how many push-ups can they do girls can do on their knees but uh, I just had a patient she's in her 40s couldn't do one setup this is a school teacher chronic anxiousness so this core strength so looking doing a pelvic lift being able to do a side plank being able to do a super man or woman you know and that it's critical so that will start strengthening the brain so these core muscles and it goes back to neurodevelopmental when our when our children were sitting up by themselves and they're crawling on their hands and knees like army men and they're getting up on there it's it's this developmental and when we lose that core strength and that balance left or right, it starts destabilizing the brain. Um, that would be, you know, one. And the other thing is, you know, they've got to uh, eat better. You know, if I eat better, eat less. You know, get better food selection. Those are critical for the brain. What would you say, because there's a lot of people that have been diagnosed with Dimension said, you know, it's only going to get worse. There's nothing we can do about it. You know, just put your affairs in order. You know, that this is the common thing that happens, especially with the aging brain uh, with our medical community. Like you said, they're not really, they're trying to find it in a pill uh, where, uh, like you said, I don't think there's going to be a pill that solves this problem. <laughs> but uh, what do you have to say for them? Because there's some people going to be watching this that are going to go, Wow, I really, I mean, I've been diagnosed with one of these early stages. Maybe they're at the two or three stage, like you're talking about. Uh, what can you tell them? Because I mean, you've seen some incredible results with people. So, well, they absolutely can change, but they've got to change. And the, di the difference is, is that in the medical model, it's drugs and surgeries. So there isn't a drug or surgery that's going to fix this problem. They don't, they don't have brain transplants. So <laughs> we've got to get their brain working better. So if that individual, is willing to do some things. And then many times they need, they need support. They need a family or a friend or they need somebody, you know, to help support them. So it can absolutely turn around and they can come to the clinic and we can do a week intensive or two weeks in intensive, work these people up, teach them how to do these things, get them turned around. And then they can uh, recommend home therapies and then have them come back periodically. So that would be the way if somebody doesn't want to accept that and wants to make a change, that would be the, the way to go. Right. I mean, I'm just maybe talk a little bit about the pilot study that you did where you showed, I think, a couple of the slides there. But when you had uh, the five people going through the study and just what can happen, we mentioned something on the slides called neuroplasticity. Some of the people might not be aware of what that is or what you're talking about. So maybe you can talk about why is neuroplasticity important and uh, how does that work into brain function? Absolutely. You know, when I, uh, I got out of school for over 40 years ago. So back then we thought you only had so many brain cells and you just kind of whittle away at them, but neuroplast, the brain changes constantly, just like our, our body changes, you know, from 20 to 30 to 40, our brain changes now. And it, it responds to the environment. What are we thinking internally and what are we doing and what are we doing to our our, our environment is affecting that. So that neuroplasticity can be negative or it can be positive. But the thing about it is, is we have the capability of neurogenesis of creating a neuron, a neuron that's functioning better. A mama neuron has a baby daughter neuron. So your every brain cell could be functioning better. So all these things we talked about are a change in activity or behavior and that will create the positive neuroplastic changes. And you can do that at 80 years old. So just using an analogy, they've done uh, Deepak Chopra said, ageless body, timeless mind. They did all these a 70, 80 year olds. They put them in weight machines. They did all these things and they actually increase their strength, flexibility, even at that age, bone density, all kinds of things. So the, so it's the same with our brain. Okay. So you can get a bigger bicep by doing these curls, you can do a specific exercise to strengthen a specific part of the brain and regenerate it.
Well, there you have it. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I know we could we could talk for hours. We have when we're at events. <laughs> in in your your latest research, you're always out there, cutting edge, finding what works, what doesn't work.